Welcome to all those who are here this morning and those that are online, and thank you to whoever or those people, maybe it was a group, that cleaned our parking lot and the ramp. It's pristine, nice and dry and not slick. Um, I would add to the prayers that we've, we've uh, made uh, to everyone here and online that um, we don't fall because falling causes a lot of chain of events that we don't like very well. Would you stand with me on the call to worship, please? The Lord says, put out into deep water, let down your nets for a catch. Put your faith in Jesus and his word. Jesus blesses and fills our nets. Lord, we fall on our knees and acknowledge that we are sinners. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch people. We will trust you, Lord, and follow you and serve those you send to us. If you'll join me in prayer. God, whose word calls us to take risks and whose revelation in Jesus Christ gives us confidence to try again when we have failed. Reveal yourself to us now as we listen to the scriptures and lift our eyes to see your face. Grant that we may feel your presence and discern your will. Equip us to respond with confident faithfulness to work you give us to do. We want to go where you send us and live up to what you expect of us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Our opening hymn, number 491, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling.
The church is a place for the glory of God and our neighbor's good. When we give our offering, it is an opportunity to do both, give glory to God and benefit our neighbors. This month, our special offering will be going to the Hagerstown Food Pantry. You can give your church offering in the offering plate in the back of the sanctuary and your special offering in the service cup. Or you can give to either offering through the Tithely app or our website, middlecreekchurch.org. I'll be reading from Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Good morning. Good morning. So, bride and groom. I don't think I'm coming through. Am I coming through? All right, I'll just switch it to the other one. We'll use this one to figure that other one out in a minute. Okay. Well, good morning. <laughs> So a bride and a groom had asked the bakery to inscribe on their wedding cake a Bible verse. 1 John 4, 18, which reads, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The cake decorator, however, missed the one. <laughs> and it was John 4, 18, which says, For you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. <laughs> so make sure when you're quoting scripture, you get the right reference there. The one makes a difference. <laughs> so that was 1 John 4.18 versus John 4.18. Good morning. I want to talk today about a new kind of a mini-series, I guess you could say. But it's in our bigger context of the church being the victorious church this year. Looking at Ephesians and 1 Corinthians. But specifically, in Ephesians and 1 Corinthians, we're going to break down a few scriptures on the church and marriage and sexuality. And I want to talk about this uh, throughout the month of February. I feel like it's a great time of the year to do that. We, a lot of times we think of hearts and we think of decorations and we think of romance in February because of Valentine's Day, which is actually a Catholic holiday on February 14th honoring the life of St. Valentine. But our culture has grabbed onto that. And we have made it a big deal in February. I guess if they didn't, the only other big deal in February would be the Super Bowl, right? And I know some people don't think that's a big deal. But I, for one, am sort of happy because Matthew Stafford is going to the Super Bowl for the L.A. Rams. For those of you who have no clue who that is, 
He was a quarterback for the Lions for years. And he won zero playoff games with the Lions. He was in a few, but won zero. Now, one year later, with a new team, he is in the Super Bowl. It shows you the difference that the team makes. My, my daughter noted, see, Dad, it's all about how bad the Lions are. I said, yes, I get that. So the Lions are terrible. You go to another team, you go to the Super Bowl. You play with the Lions, you get nothing. So I want to start by uh, acknowledging that I know this topic sometimes can make us feel a little bit uncomfortable, especially when we talk about it in church. But I want to recognize that this is a really important thing that the church needs to talk about. And as we get into it, I want to start by acknowledging something that I think we need to know. And this maybe uh, it's not in the front of our minds when we think about our world today, but I think it's really critical to understanding how America has shifted in how we think since the 1960s. And I know sometimes when we look at New Testament scriptures, I hear the argument from some people that say, well, maybe that was their culture, or this was a cultural reference. And I admit there could be some truth to that. But before we put too much emphasis on what used to be a normal thing in the culture, I want to flip that on its head for a minute. And I want to say maybe the problem is not what used to be cultural. Maybe the problem is the way our culture has gone. Maybe our culture now looks at things that used to be cultural. We think, well, that's how it once was, and it's no longer relevant. Instead of saying, well, maybe our culture has shifted and made us think about things in the Bible differently. So I believe there was three movements that converged together and really became prominent in the 1960s. I'm not going to say that's when they started. I'm not going to say that's where the roots were, but it became prominent at that time in our culture. And I believe these three things have so influenced our culture that now we are permeated with this way of thinking. And to think differently in our culture makes us stand out. But the Bible has never been afraid of standing out against the culture around them. Because they were never supposed to be just whatever everyone else is saying. And ironically, the first point here is counterculturalism. But there was a movement that emerged in the 1960s of counterculturalism. In other words, they wanted to upend the norms and upend what was normal from traditional standpoint in our culture. And that went with these next two. They were kind of, I'm giving you obviously short snippets here. If you want to dig into all these, feel free. And I'm happy to dig into them with you. But the second one then is feminism, which leading to the idea of women's liberation. There's always been different stages of feminism. And one of those, of course, led to our amendment of giving women the right to vote. But at the 1960s time, it moved into this idea of women's liberation. And then that moved into this other idea here of sexual revolution or the sexual liberation. And combining all of these together, it changed our culture, and how we view things, especially when it comes to norms of sexuality, of gender, of marriage, and all of that together. So we took these ways of thinking, and that became the dominant way of thinking in our culture, so much so that it's hard to think before this time now. Now, some of you grew up before this time, so you remember what that was like. And you may actually hold to ideals and standards before this. But for anybody like me who grew up after this, to think differently, you're just considered odd, weird, old, prudish, whatever, because you don't hold to the standards of the current ways of thinking which came out of this. But I believe one of the biggest lies of these movements was this idea of using the word liberation as if it actually brought freedom. Because I don't believe that these movements actually brought freedom to our culture or to individuals. Instead, I believe it was a lie of the enemy to actually ensnare and trap. In John 8, 44, it says, Jesus speaking now to the Pharisees, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he speaks his native language, he lies for he is the father of lies. And in John 10, 10, Jesus says it's the thief that comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. So the evil one is always trying to steal and kill and destroy by speaking lies. So let's go back to the original lie in Genesis 3, 
verse 1. I wrote down 3-2 on the outline, but it's actually 3-1. When the woman is speaking to the serpent, or the evil one speaking through the serpent here. And look at what the evil one says, the quote that it gives. Did God really say, you must not eat? And that's the lie of the evil one, is trying to get you to focus on something that God said that you can't or should not do. All the other trees in the garden were available to them, but there was one that God said, do not eat from. And what the evil one wants to get us to think is that the restriction is bad for us. The restriction is harmful for us. If we want to be really free, we need to get rid of any restrictions. If we want to be really free, we need to get rid of any thing saying we can't or we shouldn't. That sounds like freedom. And that's the lie that we get sold. You're free, so don't worry about the restriction that God placed here. And when God places a restriction, it actually brings freedom. It's the opposite. So Genesis 3, 6, look at what the woman says realizes here she says she saw the fruit of the tree was good for food it was pleasing to the eye and every other tree in the garden had that description good for food and pleasing to the eye so that wasn't just this tree every tree in the garden was good for food and pleasing to the eye and she was free to enjoy any other tree that was good for food and pleasing to the eye but there was one and look at this other part it was desirable for gaining Wisdom. I'm not going to focus on the wisdom for this message because that's not really my message. But I want you to see the lie. Desirable for gaining. She thought by breaking God's command, she thought by breaking the restriction God put on her, she was actually going to be gaining. And so I believe that was the lies that the evil one sells us as human beings. God's restriction is going to limit you. God's restriction is bad for you. Break that, be free, and you will gain. When what the evil one actually does is use that to ensnare, use that to trap, use that to get you into a bondage, use you to steal, use that to steal, kill, and destroy. The blessing would have been for her to acknowledge and honor the command of God. And by honoring the command of God, would have been free and would have been blessed. John 8, 31 and 32, going back to John 8, Jesus says it this way. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus says, my teachings actually set you free. If you want real freedom, follow my teachings. My teachings set you free, not the lies of the evil one. God's way is meant to be a blessing Satan has tried to use our sinfulness and our desire for what we think is freedom and has twisted that. And so I believe in the times that were emerging in the 1960s, the countercultural revolution, the sexual revolution, the sexual liberation, and then the the diversion of the idea of women's liberation all came together I believe, to create negative consequences. And again, some of those had some positive things to it. It's hard for me to find anything positive about the sexual revolution. But the other two, the women's liberation movement, the counterculture movement, had some positive aspects of it. It had some things in it that were good. But I think a lot of it produced negative consequences that we are living with. And specifically, when you get to the sexual liberation The idea here was separating sexual activity from the one man, the one woman in one marriage. As if the purpose of it was whatever you find pleasurable, whatever you find fun, whatever you enjoy. If it's adultery, divorce, pornography, rape, abuse, any of that. And it separates it from the context that God put it in, which was the way of true freedom. All of these things led to destruction. 
And along with it now, we had a great increase in abortions, in gender confusion, LGBTQ. All of this came out of that time. Now to look back at scripture and look at it differently feels weird in our culture. But I want us to say maybe it's our culture that's got it wrong <laughs> and not the Bible. Maybe the Bible and New Testament has it right and we're the ones who are off track. So if we think about that for the next few weeks, I'm going to look at things in Scripture in Ephesians and 1 Corinthians that are going to sound a little different to our current ears after this. But maybe it's the one that's right and we're the one that needs to change. And that's a process called repentance if we believe that we're wrong and we need to change to become more like the Bible, change our mindset, change our mind about how we view something, or change our direction, change what we're doing. So we're going to start with Ephesians 5.32. And what I'm going to do here in Ephesians 5.32 at first is going to sound like I want to completely 180. <laughs> because the first thing I want to say in Ephesians 5.32 that I'm going to get back to how these all tie together in a minute. But Ephesians 5.32, this is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. What I'm talking about now is Christ and the church. I thought you were talking about marriage and sexuality. Yeah, I'm going to get back to that. But the main point in Ephesians 5 is not marriage and sexuality. The main point in Ephesians 5 is Christ and the church. That needs to be known first. We need to look at the scripture and see first what's the main point. The main point is Christ and the church. So hang in there. We'll tie this all together in a minute. But look at this word mystery. What does the word mystery mean? This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. Does that mean it's something we can't understand? Does that mean it's so mysterious I don't know what he's talking about? Sometimes we read the Bible and that's how we, we end up in a mystery. But that's not the point here. If you look back to Ephesians 3, just two chapters earlier, verses 4 and 5, you see Paul talking about what this idea of mystery means. Okay, so in Ephesians 3, 4, and 5, he says, In reading this, then, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Now, first of all, recognize my insight into the mystery of Christ. That means he's got something to offer us about what he calls this mystery of Christ. And what is that? Verse 5. He says, which was not made known to people in other generations. That's why it was a mystery. It was hidden in other generations. It was concealed in other generations. It was there, it just wasn't revealed. It was there, it was just concealed or covered. But it was still there. As it has now been revealed... In the New Testament, it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets, of which Paul is one of them. So Paul says, now I'm going to take something that's a mystery. It was concealed, it was covered in previous generations before Jesus, but now after Jesus it's been revealed, it's been put open. All right? We might think about this as a birthday gift or a Christmas gift. You have those presents there. And you know something is special underneath that wrapping, but you don't know what it is. You just know something special is under that wrapping. And when I open it, I'll find out what is there. That's a lot of what happens in the Old Testament. That Jesus is there concealed. Jesus is there hidden. Jesus is there covered, and in the New Testament, it gets open, and he gets revealed. So one of the ways that Jesus is concealed or covered in the Old Testament is through marriage. So I'm still not exactly tracking with you here, but I want you to think about this. The mystery of marriage, 532, is that in the Old Testament, before Jesus, God had marriage to reveal or conceal him and the church. That was a higher purpose of marriage. 
In fact, marriage is meant to be temporary. Matthew twenty two thirty. We talked about this in, in relation to uh, the resurrection at Bible study and how what's going to happen in the resurrection and the Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, they believed that once we died, we were dead. There was no future. The body would never come back again. And they tested Jesus thinking, well, this will be an easy one to get him on. Because they had another law in the law of Moses, and they believed in the law of Moses. The law of Moses said, if two people are married and the husband dies without having any children, then the brother, if he's not married, has to marry that woman to keep the family line going. And that goes on until there's no other options. So they give him this great big scenario, thinking they're going to trick Jesus. So the first one had a wife, they had no children. Then the brother came along and they had no children and he died. All the way down to seven brothers. Not seven brides for seven brothers. <laughs> Some of you may have seen that movie. This is one bride for seven brothers. <laughs> At different times. One, two, three, all the way down to seven. And they say, okay, if you believe in this so-called resurrection, okay, when the resurrection comes, who is she going to be married to? She can't be married to all seven. Surely not. Come on, Jesus. That sounds ridiculous. And he said, well, here's the point. Yes, the resurrection is true. But at the resurrection, 2230, in case you're stuck on that point, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And some of you are already saying, well, now I know why it's heaven. <laughs> there will be no marriage in eternity between individual people now there's a lot of questions I know we can get into like what does that mean about my relationship with my spouse and eternity I'm not going to get into all those questions right now okay I believe there will still be a special relationship between people that you had special relationships with here let's leave it at that but my main point here is it's not the same it's not going to be a marriage relationship between you and that person in eternity in the resurrection. What is going to be happening in eternity? The marriage between Christ and the church. It's Christ marrying the church. The church is the bride and Jesus is the groom and we will be intimately joined together. And that's what's concealed in marriage, but revealed in the mystery. So what is the purpose of marriage? The purpose of marriage is to reveal Jesus and his relationship to the church. That's the purpose of marriage. We need to know that before we get into all the details about marriage. What's the purpose of it? Yes, in general, I could say for everything, right? The purpose of marriage is to glorify God. But specifically, marriage glorifies God by revealing the relationship between Jesus and his church. Let's go back to Ephesians 5, and I'll show you that. So Ephesians 5, 32. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. That's the topic. So I couldn't talk about God's victorious church without talking about marriage, because marriage reveals the relationship between Christ and his church. So now, here's the question. What is the relationship between Christ and the church? What does marriage show us about the relationship between Christ and the church? Here's what it shows us. Number one, 523. Christ is the head of the church. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body of which he is the Savior. So Christ is the head of the church. Next, we go to back all the way to Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 22, same book, a few chapters earlier. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church. 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Christ is the head of the church. That's what marriage reveals to us. What else does marriage reveal to us? The church is his body. Again, 23, which is his body. 
the comma, right before that, the end of 22, the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Back to Ephesians 5, verse 30. For we are members of his body. You see this? Jesus is the head of the church. We are members of his body. Members, plural. We are all the parts. He's the head, we're all the parts. This is what the word membership actually means. I know we've used membership a lot over the years for a lot of different things. We've used it in the church. I'm become a member of the church. What does a member of the church mean? You're a part of it. And you're a vital part of it. I don't know any of us who would like to say, I just want to get rid of a few parts of my body. <laughs> now we do if they're causing aches and pains and problems. And keep that in mind if your behavior with the church. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want you to be the part that's causing the aches and the pains and the problems, okay? But when the church functions healthy, like your body functions healthy, you don't want to lose parts of it. You need all those parts. They're all helpful. They're all beneficial. Our desire is to have all of our parts, and they work well, functioning together. We are members of his body. We together are the members of the body of Christ. But I want you to notice something else about what it means to be the body. What does it mean to be the body of Christ? Not just that I'm a part or a member or an individual of a group. But there is a joining together between the head and the body. Would anybody like to just separate the two? <laughs> Guillotine. <laughs> or the old, uh, you know, when someone's trying to intimidate you, you know. You do this or else. <laughs> I really don't want my head and body separated. <laughs> I would prefer them together. Why? Because when the head and the body are not together, that's death. The head and the body are meant to be united together. No separation between the two. What does this say about Christ and the church? While yes, there is a distinction. Jesus is not the church. The church is not Jesus. The head and the body can be thought of differently in that way. They're meant to be together. They're meant to be joined. They're not meant to be separated. Okay? Now, number three. Christ is the Savior, Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Christ is the Savior of the body. Which means, number four, that Christ loves the church. Look at verse 25 now. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Christ loves the church. Christ saves the church. Christ makes the church holy with self-sacrificial love. Look at 26. Or actually back to 25. Love the church and gave himself up for her. He loved the church so much he gave himself up for her. He gave his whole life. Bleeding and suffering and dying because he said, I love you. And now 26, why? To make her holy, to cleanse her by the washing with water through the word. 27, to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain, without wrinkle, without blemish, but holy and blameless. He cleans us and makes us beautiful. We might bring a bunch of sin to the table, but he cleanses us, and he washes us, and he makes us beautiful in his sight. So Christ loves the church. He makes the church holy. He gives his life for the church. Now think about this too. I want to say a few more things about this holiness. Jesus and the church are united as one. The church is his body. If Jesus is holy and pure, how can his body not be? How can his body be an unholy, sinful mess if he is holy and pure? It can't happen. That's why he has to make us holy. He has to make us pure so that we can be joined together. That means his blood cleanses our sin. His blood takes away that sin. He makes us right with him so that we don't have that stain and that wrinkle and that blemish that we will carry with us. 
This doesn't mean that he's in the process of cleaning up our, our behavior, although he does that too. It means he washes us through his salvation to make us righteous and holy so we can be joined together and we can be one body. And in eternity, we won't carry those things with us. We're not going into eternity with all of our sinful junk. He makes us holy. He makes us pure. We are joined together. Number five, he feeds and cares for his church. He provides for his church, Ephesians 5, 29. After all, no one ever hated his own body. Now, I know in our own sinfulness, sometimes we do. We look at ourselves and say, well, I hate this about myself, or I hate myself. You know, I, I, I get that. But the point is, he's making here is, you still care about your body. Even though you might say those things, it's because you're disappointed or you're hurt or you're upset or you're angry about certain things. But deep down, you really do care about your body. Deep down, you really do care about yourself. And he says, just because of that, you feed yourself, you care for yourself. And Christ does that for the church. This is why we should have confidence when we approach God with our needs. Well, I don't know if God wants to provide for me. Well, does he love you? Does he care for you? Is he a good person to his church? Now, he is good to his church, and we should come with confidence that he wants to provide for us. So this is what Christ does for the church. And all this so far that I've mentioned is what Jesus does for us. And that's the good news of grace, not what we can do for him, but what he does for us. So the marriage is to reveal this relationship. That's the purpose of the marriage. Now, our response then, what are we to do? 24, as the church submits to Christ. Our relationship in response is to submit to our loving Lord, to honor our head, to love and honor and respect our head Jesus. Therefore, I'm bringing this all back together now. Since the point of marriage is the glory of God, since the point of marriage is to reveal Christ and his loving, self-sacrificial leadership on behalf of the church, our marriages then are to be an imperfect reflection of what Christ does perfectly for us. An imperfect reflection of what Christ does perfectly for us. Now, our mirrors today are pretty good. They're pretty clear. But they're not perfect. And old mirrors were a little less clear. And sometimes you might look in, you know, the water or whatever, and it's a little less clear. The idea here is that whatever the reflection is, is not the perfect. The reflection has some flaws. You can see what it's supposed to be, but it's not exact. That's what a reflection is. So our marriages are a reflection. We're not the perfect. The perfect is what Jesus does for the church. That's the perfect. So it's not like our marriage, it's not like Jesus is doing his love based on our love. It's not like Jesus is saying, like you love each other, that's how I'm going to be. <laughs> that would be terrible if Jesus was like that. <laughs> but you should model your marriage on what I am to my church. So when we think about what should we do with our marriages, why am I even married? I know a lot of us thought, well, I just liked this person and wanted to be with them. <laughs> I'm glad. But that's not the reason for marriage. Or I'm just there until it's not fun anymore, and then if it's not, I'm out. It's not the reason for marriage. The reason for marriage is to show Jesus and the church to our world. And as Christians, that's our goal. To use our marriages as a witness to our world. Imperfectly. And say this is what Christ does perfectly and we just do it imperfectly. But I want to model this best I can. So therefore, in our marriages... Since Christ, oh, let me back up a minute. In our marriages, husbands then show the role of Jesus and wives the church. 
That means there's a difference, there's a distinction between the two. Both equally loved by God, both equal in the sight of God, male and female, both made in the image of God, and both could have different strengths and weaknesses, but the picture is Jesus is being shown by the husband and the church is being shown by the wife. So since Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the household. Before 1960s, that would not have been a controversial statement in this culture. <laughs> now it is. Because people think when I say that, that you're going to be, oh, you're male chauvinism, and you think the woman's inferior, and this, that. that's not what I'm saying. But maybe our culture has gotten things so messed up that we can't even acknowledge this anymore. But if you look at what that means to be the head of the household... Maybe you won't think that it's such a domineering idea. Because the husband is to show the love of Christ to that woman. Which means, number two, the church is Christ's body. Therefore, the husband and wife are one body, though individual members. Jesus and the body are one, not separate. Therefore, verse 31, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Not two fleshes, one flesh. Jesus expounds on this in Matthew 19, 6, after quoting the exact same verse from Genesis. They are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. Joined together in the Greek has the idea of being glued together or stuck together. So you can tell your spouse, you're stuck with me. <laughs> you're stuck. And a lot of times, what does our culture do? Uses the lie of the evil one and uses stuck in a bad way. Oh, you're stuck with them. You're stuck with that person. That's a bad thing. Be free. Get out. Rip it apart. But I like the idea of stuckness because it tells me Jesus isn't leaving me. Because the picture is Christ in the church. Jesus does it perfectly, and I'm so glad that when I mess up, he doesn't say, I'm stuck with you. Too bad. You're no longer in my family. You're no longer my bride. You've messed up. You've sinned. You've done wrong. You didn't honor me. You didn't respect me. You didn't come to church. You didn't read your Bible. You didn't whatever. No. I'm sticking with you until the end. Hebrews 13, 5. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. That's what Jesus does for his church. So husbands, if we want to model that, I'm modeling I'm not leaving you and I'm not forsaking you. I don't care how you treat me, <laughs> how you respond, how much you fall short. I am not leaving you. We are stuck together. Now, again, even the Bible acknowledges if that person has already broken the covenant with you or they don't want to stay, you can't make them. There is reasons and times when divorce happens. But what I'm trying to say here is the picture, the perfect picture, is Jesus doesn't leave the church, the church doesn't leave Jesus, and we want to model that picture. We want to model being stuck together. We want to model that we are together no matter what. Until, as the old uh, vows go, death do us part. That doesn't mean you're plotting murder. <laughs> Until death do us part. Now, next one. Uh, Christ loves the church. Therefore, husbands are to love their wives. In what way? He says it, 25, right? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Gave himself up for her. Gave himself up for her. He served the church. He laid down his life for the church. He washed the feet of the church. He made himself the servant of the church. He said, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. I came to give my life as a ransom for many. As I have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. In our wedding, Karen and I washed each other's feet. Washing the feet 
I'm becoming the servant for you. It takes a different picture of the head, doesn't it? So he washes with water, the cleansing through the word, to present her to himself as a radiant church. That's what Jesus does for us. In other words, Jesus is making us radiant and holy and pure and clean. And husbands, we should be taking the lead on spiritual matters and saying, I want to make sure that we are putting Jesus first in our lives. And research shows that the children, if their father is engaged spiritually, are more likely to follow what the father does regardless of what the mother does. Even if the mother is not in church, but the dad makes church a priority and makes scripture a priority, makes living for Jesus a priority, the kids are most likely to follow that. If it's the opposite, there's a less chance. He feeds and cares for the church, 29. No one ever hates his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. He who loves his wife loves himself, 28 says. Feed and care for you know, a lot of times we think of the wife feeding and caring for the husband, but this is the opposite. <laughs> I don't think that necessarily means you need to cook all the meals. <laughs> but there should be an effort there to say, I want to make sure you're provided for. I want to make sure your needs are met. I want to make sure I'm serving you. Five, Christ is the Savior of the church. Therefore, wives are to submit to their husbands as Christ submits to the church. That's why I submit yeah, as the church submits to Christ, sorry. And that's always the part everybody focuses on and gets all upset about. <laughs> and again, we're looking at this from the 1960s movements. Before that, most people would not have thought of that as a negative thing. But I want you to see here that if the husband is doing all of those things, even imperfectly, because it will surely be imperfect, the woman, yes, imperfectly, will want to submit herself to her husband. Why? Because her role is to show the honor to Jesus. As the husband's role is to show the love of Jesus to the wife. In the very first verse that we read with today is 21. I think it needs to be read. Submit to one another. You have that one, Brad? 21. Submit to one another in the fear of Christ or the reverence for Christ. Maybe it's not on there. You can read it in your Bible. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, whatever role you have, you're to use that to serve that other person. Jesus used him, his role. He was never not Jesus. He was never not the Savior. He was never not the head of the church, but he used it to serve. Husbands are to use their role to serve. Likewise, women are to use their roles to serve. So Ephesians 5.33. You have 5.33 up there. Each of you must love. That's 23. <laughs> That's all right. Each of you must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. So here's my challenges for you. And then I'm going to make a final statement today. Number one. In looking at this, it's easy to say, hey, I've fallen short. <laughs> I've not measured up. Is there a sin you need to confess and ask forgiveness for? At least of God, maybe of your spouse. But here's the good news, that Jesus has already said, I forgive you. I forgive you of that sin. I'm not trying to say you have to be a perfect model of this. But if you have sinned, if you have fallen short, acknowledge that, confess that. Secondly, if you are married, what can you do this week to serve and submit to your spouse? Just what can I do this week specifically? And then thirdly, keep coming back for the rest of the series. At least watch it online. Because God wants to bless our marriages. God wants to bless the church. God wants to bless how we use sexuality. But the evil one wants to steal and to kill and to destroy. And he wants us to think that, well, some of that stuff's not needed anymore. 
Let's have freedom. Let's not use God's restrictions. And God says, no, when you walk in my understanding, you'll actually walk in blessing. And you'll actually have freedom by following me. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then God will be glorified and honored, and we'll be able to show the world what Christ and the church is all about. Let's pray together. God, we thank you now for this message today. And I know a lot of us are coming at different angles when we look at this. We have different marital statuses and different marital experiences. Some of us are not married now, but have been. Some of us are not married yet. Some of us are married now. And God, I pray whatever state we're in, you will help us to realize the main point again. Christ and the church. You love the church. You gave yourself for the church. You've cleansed the church. You are serving the church. And may we, in turn, submit and honor you. Whatever role of our marital status is, may we honor you for your glory and your purposes. God, if there's anything we need to confess today, we ask that you'd forgive us. And then help us this week to honor you the best we can in our sinfulness. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. I thought it appropriate today to end with this one. When we think about um, our mutual service and submission to each other. Number 307, will you let me be your servant? Let's stand together. So may God bless you this week and receive the love of Christ that he offers to you and then share that love with others.